So welcome everybody. And we're at the end of Biodiversity Month where we celebrate our amazing flora and fauna in Australia. So happy National Biodiversi Biodiversity Month. I also wanted to, before we get going, um, acknowledge that I myself uh, am standing on Wurundjeri country and I'd like to pay my respect to the Wurundjeri people, uh, leader, um, elders, past, present and emerging. And I welcome uh, any traditional owners, that elders and owners that we might have in the audience today and uh, welcome you all in whichever traditional owner country that you are currently standing on. So my name's Julia Cirillo and I'm the Water Watch Coordinator at Mary Creek Management Committee. And my role is to work with schools and the local community to raise awareness of the importance of looking after our local creeks and wetlands. I do this in a number of ways, uh, including online, <laughs> and using citizen science and working with many stakeholders, including local government, to get the best outcomes for our creeks. So it's really, really, we're really excited um, that you're all joining us today, this evening. I'll be moderating our webinar tonight. And to start off with, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Ewer from the Merry Paddle, who will give us an introduction to well, what is the Merry Paddle? and some of the things that we're planning, how the group came about and their aims and how you can be involved. And I'm also a member in my spare time as a volunteer. Peter will be follow closely followed by Dr. Mel Clampt. Mel has been studying the platypus since 2009 through her honours and PhD studies. Mel recently started working at Melbourne Water as an interpretation officer in the Education and Water Watch area. In her time off, Mel is a volunteer member of the startup committee for the Friends of Tara... Tarala Creek. You'll have to tell me about that one, Mel. I'm not even, I don't know where that is. And she's also a passionate Melbourne Demon supporter, as you could probably see in the background later. Uh, Mel will be presenting on all things platypus, including biology and habitat requirements, major areas where platypus are found, hist a bit of information about the, the platypus on the Merry Creek as well. And I really got to do a big shout out and thank you to our funders for tonight. Thank you to the cities of Darebin, Moreland, Whittlesea and Yarra for helping fund this event. And thank you to Melbourne Water for providing Dr Mel. We're very lucky. And I want to thank all my fellow members as well of the Plat Merry Platypus Paddle. So members of the Merry Paddle here tonight and the main people on the organising committee are Trevor Moyle, Kinga Harding, David Redfern, Colin Abbott, Joe Perry, myself and Peter Ewer. But we are always looking for more support and, and Peter will, uh, will tell you more about that um, on the next slide. Peter, welcome. Um so the Merry Paddle, I guess, it takes its inspiration from uh, some of the things that are going on in um, Europe and North America around using iconic species to quote unquote rewild um, areas of um, degraded habitat. Um, you, if you follow this, um, if you follow this um, kind of uh, literature, then. There's been some pretty um, amazing success stories in this in this space, uh, including beaver in um, the UK, and uh, the, uh, the grey wolf in Yellowstone National Park, um, and the, the the concept I suppose applied to the Merry Creek is to kind of use the platypus as the kind of iconic species that we can encourage people to take a greater interest in 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 the creek, um, but I. I I um, hasten to say that rewilding is really a kind of Anglo-centric um, kind of concept because um, the First Nations people will rightly point out that they've been caring successfully for the country uh, for, for country for forty thousand years. So rewilding is probably not the right term. But um, if you can just um, uh, you just uh, take the example of of um, you know using these uh, kind of ideas as an inspiration to get people behind. Uh, ecological restoration. And it's a term that's being used a lot more now, Peter, isn't it? A bit like citizen science. And uh, so I suppose it's something it that people can identify with. Yeah, yeah we've, uh, locally, we've just got to be careful that we pay due respect to the traditional owners because it's uh, European settlement that's um, degraded uh, the Merry Creek, not the original owners. Um, so the Merry Paddle is is the is the you know the brand name for for this. It, it's a collaboration of a number of existing organisations. It's um, auspiced by Friends of Merry Creek, where I'm on the committee, uh, and then a number of other uh, like-minded uh, organisations have uh, endorsed the concept, as you can see. Uh, uh, in the in the purple, the list of uh, groups who have, have signed up to it. 
Um, and we've got uh, a number of you know problems that uh, we face. Um, you're all lovers of Merry Creek and will be, you know, as disheartened as I am every time I go down there to see the amount of plastic um, pollution in the in the creek. Um, but um, the uh, uh, real uh, culprit, if we can just go to the next slide, um, the real culprit. Uh, is something in the left-hand column there called urban stream syndrome, and that's the conversion of a natural waterway into what's essentially an urban drain. Um, what this uh, um, the, the 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 chief problem we face is this problem called urban stream syndrome, which is um, the conversion of the waterway into a drain. Um, what what happens is that uh, in a high rainfall event. Um, the stormwater runoff um, becomes a torrent and basically sweeps away the ecology of, of, of the creek and uh, really limits the food supply uh, for the platypus and, and other species. Um, and so what we, what we uh, want to do is to commission a study by uh, Josh Griffiths from a group called Environment Enviro DNA to um, give us a, a program of works that would be required to uh, remediate the creek to um, restore it to the level where a, a viable population of platypus could um, could exist. And um, can I say to you that uh, the next twelve months is going to be really important in this in this process. Um, at the moment, there are planning decisions on foot in which the the headwaters of the Murray Creek are under pressure from urban development. So, urban stream syndrome will be. Um, uh, worsened unless uh, good decisions are taken. And one of those would be to establish uh, a Wallen Regional Park, which the current government committed to a feasibility study for at the last election. And that feasibility study will be um, uh, released shortly. So um, really looking to uh, a decision where the remaining wetlands in the headwaters of the creek are preserved. And if we can do that, then we can start to uh, uh, tackle this problem of uh, urban stream syndrome. So uh, would really uh, appreciate your support uh, going forward as we as we take up this uh, take up this campaign. Um, clearly, um, your next year will be um, vitally important. Um, obviously, heading into an election year, um, so we've got we've got uh, the capacity to make our voices heard in a way that really benefits uh, the creek. Um, you'll see if you uh, follow Friends of Merry Creek on uh, Facebook, Instagram, or on our website, uh, you'll see all of the updates uh, about what we're doing uh, for uh, through through the paddle, beginning as I say with this scientific study about um, the remediation works that will be required, and we really want to make that the kind of platform to galvanise people about what they can do locally, um, including their own water tanks in their own backyards to uh, limit uh, urban runoff and so on. So there's, there, there'll be lots of opportunities to do things. Um, and if we can uh, coordinate them around uh, a, a vision for the ecology of the creek as a whole, then in the long term, we, uh, we hope to um, restore a viable population of uh, platypus in the creek. Um, really appreciate your time today. Uh, it's terrific to uh, have this number of people on board and uh, really look forward to keeping you updated and getting you involved in the work uh, as we go into the, um, into, um, the future. Thanks very much, Julia. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, I think those of us involved already in the Merry Paddle are very excited about what we've started to achieve so far. But yeah, there's so much that we'll uh, look forward to doing in the future. And as you say, in the next 12 months is quite critical. So um, there are going to be lots of opportunities for people to be involved. Um, we now do have a page on the Friends of Merry Creek website where you can find out more information. It's a bit sparse at the moment, but there will be more information coming. So um, if you want, you can keep in touch with us that way. And now, yes, I'll introduce you to Dr. Mel. Thank you so much, Mel. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Julia. And thanks, Peter, for uh, your introduction as well. And there's definitely a few points you've mentioned there, which I'll touch on as well. Um, so uh, thanks for having me today. And um, today I'll be talking to you um, about the platypus, which is very exciting. So obviously uh, through Melbourne Water, we offer a range of citizen science uh, projects and you've probably been involved um, in maybe some or all of these um, through the Friends of Mary Creek. 
And um, we're really looking forward to kicking off some more citizen science projects once we can all get out and about again. So please stay tuned for more of those. But today we'll be largely focusing on the platypus sensors. So um, this is one of our biggest um, citizen science projects. And as uh, Peter mentioned before, the platypus is obviously a very charismatic species that everyone's very interested in. But by looking after the platypus, we cover off a lot of other local flora and fauna which need our attention as well. So as Julia introduced me earlier, and I know a few people um, have jumped on since the start of this session, I just wanted to give you a quick introduction about myself. So um, I'm an interpretation officer um, with a focus on the education and water watch programs at Melbourne Water. Um, and I've also spent a lot of time studying the platypus. So I've completed a PhD and Bachelor of Science with honours. And so I started my, I guess, platypus journey in 2009 with my honours project, which looked at uh, what resources sustain platypus in rural stream ecosystems. So I used a, a technique for stable isotope called stable isotope analysis for that. Um, and I had one site in New South Wales and one here in Victoria as well. And um, I guess between the PhD, I completed some research looking at climate change modelling in relation to the platypus. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, during the presentation today. Um, and also completed my PhD um, looking at the impacts of land use and climate on the platypus as well. Um, and I've done a few uh, bits and pieces of research since finishing up that PhD as well. And if you are interested in getting into the science of things, I'm more than happy to um, share some publications. I've been lucky enough to have accepted by scientific journals, uh, which Julia and she can send them out to you all if you're interested in having a bit of a closer look. And what's most important is you need to know that I'm this much excited about platypus. Uh, this was out one night surveying the platypus. Um, it was a very cold night, but I was well rugged up and just very excited to, to get involved with this really cool creature. So you might need to stop me later, Julia. I might keep talking all night. So just let me know when I need to wrap it up. <laughs> All right, so um, what's in a name? So um, the platypus has a, a few different names and, and we will get to what the plural of, pla plural of platypus is as well because I always get asked that question. Um, so the Wurundjeri uh, Woiwurrung people um, call the platypus the Dalai Wurrung um, and this goes back to a story of creation um, between the duck and the water rat um, and uh, just letting you know that that's information from a Google search we had um, looking back um, uh, on some information from the Indigenous Australians. And the early Europeans, however, um, thought the platypus was a hoax at first. Um, eventually, once they realised it wasn't a hoax, they described, described it as a, a quadruped, uh, as big, as large as a cat, with eyes, colour and skin of a mole and the webbed feet of a duck. Okay, so very unusual description, but a pretty accurate one. Um, and in Western science, the scientific name um, is Ornithorhynchus anatinus. And I've had to say that a fair few times, but I still don't know if I nail it. <laughs> uh, and the plural of the platypus is in, flat, in fact platypus, or you can say platypus as, as well, because it's obviously the only one. But not um, platypi. Can't say platypi. No, not platypi. Unfortunately, platypi is not correct, as much as it sounds pretty cool, um, although it might sound more like a culinary dish as well. <laughs> That's true. Those. It does sound like a cuisine, <laughs> doesn't it? Yes, exactly right. So, yeah, please don't eat them. <laughs> Um, so the platypus is quite unique and, and we know that it's an egg-laying mammal as a monotreme. Um, however, it does have a lot of features of many other types of organisms. So it's mammalian in the fact that it has uh, really thick insulating fur, it's warm-blooded and it also produces milk uh, for, its, for their young. Uh, they have bird-like features in terms that they have a bill, they have webbed feet and they lay eggs and reptilian features in terms of um, production of venom, but also that their legs are out to the side of their bodies in terms of that body structure. So um, just as an image here, because you don't really get to see these very often, but this is the spur on the male platypus. Um, and these are located on the, the back side of the hind legs on both sides. And um, there's a, a venom duct that connects to a gland um, further up the leg. And apparently it really does hurt if you get spurred by a platypus. Um, not that there's been many documented um, 
studies of that actually happening, but apparently in the instances that it did occur that even um, morphine wasn't enough to take the pain away and then says the sensation lasts for many months. So I wouldn't recommend um, being spurred by one. So if you ever do um, come into an occasion where you need to pick up a platypus, and I would only encourage you to do so if you really had to, if it needed care, for example, is to pick it up by the base of the tail. If you pick it up by the base of the tail, so holding it long ways like this, um, they can't actually wriggle around to get you with the spur. So obviously they use these in terms of, you know, battles with, you know, other mates, uh, sorry, other males or predators, you know, around mating season in particular. In terms of the platypus's life cycle, so uh, they breed once a year and they'll usually have a, a small number of eggs, around one to three. Um, and these are, are laid around two to three weeks after mating. So mating we usually see around Australia, usually anywhere from July through to October. And um, the eggs will hatch around 10 days after incubation and the hatchlings are only very small and they'll um, lap milk off their mother, mother's belly, which is excreted um, through the skin. And the females will be producing milk uh, anywhere from late September through to early March. And these um, young obviously start off as tiny pink little jelly beans, as you can see in that top picture there, uh, very cute. Um, and they'll develop in the burrow for up to four months and um, emerge looking very similar to an adult platypus that you would see. So um, even this picture down the bottom, obviously they're kind of just starting to get their fur. So these guys would usually still be in the burrow at that age you see uh, in the image there. Um, so once they have their full fur and everything, that's when you'll see them emerging from the burrow. And this usually happens around January to June. So this is uh, probably a really good time to see platypus as the young are emerging and figuring out the big wide world. And you usually might see them in some uh, funny scenarios. They might be walking away from the water or, you know, out in daylight um, as they figure out the world and how to be a platypus. And a baby platypus is also called a pug. Okay, this is a common question that I also get if you didn't know that already. It's a, it's a great name and I remember, I'm showing my age, but there was a toy, a soft toy called a puggle many years ago and that's obviously where the name came from and they looked a bit like a baby platypus. Absolutely fantastic. It looks something like this. Oh, yes. Oh, you're taking me back. They yeah. don't have them. Do they, they don't have them anymore, I don't think, do they? I don't think they sell I'm them I'm actually anymore. not sure. That's my original one from when uh, I was younger. So it sits on my bookshelf because um, it's pretty cute. So I haven't ever parted with it. <laughs> Must have been where the love of platypus started from for me, I guess. I think so. <laughs> so in terms of a little bit more about the platypus, so um, they like to camp out and nest in burrows. So they're either out swimming around um, or they're back in their burrows chilling out. Um, they'll reach maturity about two years of age. Um, unfortunately, there is a high juvenile uh, mortality rate, as I mentioned um, earlier, there's a lot of threats to juveniles. Um, for example, if they're in the burrows and they're not yet ready to swim and leave and there's a flooding event, they can actually drown in the burrow. Um, when they're out looking for new territories, they can obviously um, succumb to predation um, as well as just getting a little bit lost um, and, you know, maybe even going across roads and things like that. But that's sort of something more you'd see in Tasmania. So um, unfortunately for the platypus, it's not an easy life in their early years, but they can live quite a long time. So some of the oldest um, platypus in both capt captivity but also um, in the wild, so there was a uh, platypus in Mumbok Creek, which was found not too um, long ago, was uh, 21 years old. So it had been previously uh, captured in the live trapping survey and was found again. So um, that way we can get a bit of a, an idea of how long platypus um, might live for. Um, our male platypus are larger than our females. Um, so typically closer to the 40 centimetres in length for the females and towards the 50 centimetre end for the males, um, usually weigh around uh, three kilo, uh, sorry, one to two kilos. We did have a male we found at three kilogo, kilograms in the Tarago River um, and we called him T King Tarago. Uh, it was one of the largest platypus we found. Um, and they actually store fat in their tails. So if you see a platypus with a really fat tail, that's a sign that they're really healthy. If you see a platypus with a really thin strap like leathery looking tail, um, that platypus is not in good condition. So that's one of the measures that we use 
um, to look at platypus condition. And they can uh, rely on these fat stores in times where um, it's not as easy to access food. Um, and we also do see a shift in size in platypuses um, across this, um, the country. So in Tasmania, where it's cooler, we'll see much larger platypuses all the way up to Tasmania, where the platypuses are generally smaller in size overall due to the differences in climate between these um, states. I've got a question on chat, Mel, if you don't mind me interrupting you for a second. Um, and I, I don't know either. It's a great question. Um, so someone's just asked, uh, baby echidnas, are they also called puggles? I don't yes, know. they are. They are? Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Obviously it goes they, with the monotremes. <laughs> yes. And they actually look really similar. So if you've probably seen them out of context, you might actually have trouble um, telling them apart at first when they're very young as well. Oh, so yeah, very similar starting in the egg and then the, the you know, that sort of pink color and then yes. sort of hairless and yeah. Yes. Pink naked yeah. jelly beans. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Great question. <laughs> So um, as I said earlier, obviously the platypus are found all the way from Tasmania up through to Queensland. Um, they're endemic to Australia um, and mainly seen along that eastern coast other than also having a population in Kangaroo Island. Um, historically, there were records for on the mainland of South Australia as well, uh, but unfortunately um, that hasn't been seen for a very long time. Um, they're obviously mostly nocturnal, but you will see them during the day and they do uh, have a lot of active time, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that sort of explains why you can see them at all times of day. It also depends on the area that they live as well. Um, in less populated areas, you've got uh, generally a better chance of seeing them during the daylight hours as well. Um, the platypus are listed as vulnerable in Victoria and threatened in South Australia. Um, and I guess sort of overall, they're listed uh, by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as near threatened. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been listed as threatened, even though they probably um, should be. But this is because there are many unknowns about the total numbers of platypus. So, yes, studies have been done, but they haven't encapsulated the whole range of the platypus. So it's actually really difficult to know how many platypus we did have and how many we do now and therefore be able to work out, okay, how, how much reduction in population size have we seen of the platypus? Um, and, and we do know that um, there's a lot more that we need to find out. And I'll talk some more about a, quite a big study that's happening in Victoria um, at the moment and upcoming. Um, but, you know, scientists have even found that, um, you know, in Eastern Australia, in particular where platypuses were found historically, has shrunk by up to 22%. Um, for about 200,000 kilometres squared over the past 30 years. So we do know that there's, um, you know, and that's just a recent study in the last sort of year uh, that's shown how much uh, their populations are declining. The lovely Lily has said that she's learnt that platypus are vulnerable in Victoria and threatened in South Australia when I did a talk to Coburg West Primary School during remote learning. Thanks, Lily. It was fun, <laughs> wasn't it? Uh, oh, yeah, no Kahoot quiz tonight, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we've had someone else. Oh, yeah, Ray's just asked, it looks like the platypus prefer mountainous and forested areas. Is that sort of, do we know that's more the case than, say, woodlands or grassy areas or...? Yeah, we've definitely seen them um, move away from urban areas, the more sort of um, urbanised that, you know, if, for example, looking at Melbourne specifically, where I did a lot of my research that you're seeing platypus not as frequently in those urban areas. So you might see them within sort of five caves of the CBD, but now you're only really seeing them a bit further out. Um, obviously, there's always outliers to that. Um, you know, platypus do like to travel around and check out new areas, but generally we're seeing them further away from those sort of um, urban areas. So that's a big part of it as well. Um, they do really like the cooler climate. So I know that there's like great, um, you know, population in the Threadbow River, for example, to look at a, a sort of mountain climate as well. And obviously, you know, that even kind of freezes over and things like that as well. So they're pretty um, hardy in terms of what climates and they do prefer the cool ones. So in terms of the platypus, um, so I sort of had mentioned that they do really like to travel. So um, platypus do travel around sort of generally two to five kilometres per night. This is information that we have from tracking studies, but we have seen individuals that will travel up to 11 kilometres. So, um, you know, they do do a lot of work um, and this work is due to finding new territories and mates sometimes, but also just to eat the amount of food that they need to meet their energy requirements. So platypus use uh, electroreceptors in their bill 
to locate their food, which are freshwater invertebrates. And you can see some examples on the slide there. And platypus will actually consume around 15 to 30% of their wet body weight daily um, to meet their energy requirements. So if you think um, you know, of any water bugs that you've seen, they're quite small, they're quite light. The platypus can be somewhere between two to three kilos. That's quite a lot of uh, water bugs that they need to eat every night. So they'll spend you know, uh, around 12 or so hours a day um, searching and traveling for that amount of food. So um, that's why you'll sort of see them during the day, but even you know, mostly nocturnal at night as well. And as an interesting fact, platypus don't actually have like a true stomach. So what the platypus do is when they're foraging along the bottom of the waterway, uh, they'll come into contact with their prey. They'll scoop it all up in their bill. Um, they've got um, cheek pouches where they store all their food. And then when they uh, swim up to the surface, they'll use the horny grinding pads in their mouth. You might have seen them moving their bills side to side and this will crush up um, all of the invertebrates there for them to, to put down their digestive tract from there. So um, pretty cool little eating technique that the platypus have. A couple more questions for you, Mel. Um, yeah. From Ella, who's eight years old. Uh, are there different species of platypus? No, there's not, Ella. So we just have the one platypus. Only one species. There we go. So we've got to look after it, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And Dot's just said she's seen platypus several times at uh, Younger Borough in the Atherton Tablelands. Oh, and, and near Cairns sounds awesome, which I was oh, there now. Oh, it's an amazing <laughs> spot for platypus. Yeah, I got to see some uh, doing their, their uh, courtship behaviour, which was so cool. And I was there for hours and hours and hours walking up and down the creek watching them. So if you <sighs> want to go somewhere to definitely guaranteed see platypus, I would definitely put uh, Younger Borough on your list. Oh, one day I'll get there again. But closer to home, and I, I agree with Dot, I've seen them here too, um, on the Yarra at Templestowe, actually going over the suspension bridge there uh, near Odyssey House. So um, I know that's a, a, a regular spot. I've seen them there a couple of times too. So um, a good place to go. Uh, David's just said uh, they can. He, he thinks they can be found in rivers in flatter country as well because we're talking about different um, sort of ecosystems, yes. such as the Edward River near Deneloquin in New South Wales. Cool. Um, so that's that's really good to know as well. Um, oh, Jessie's asked, is genetic diversity an issue with declining population? Yeah, this is actually a big one because um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like habitat uh, habitat connectivity later but um you know if the platypus um, can't travel or if they're in a waterway which is quite far away from any other waterways then obviously you've got only so many individuals uh which will be interbreeding as well so there's a few cool studies out there if you're interested to look uh further at the genetic diversity as well um that have sort of looked at a few sort of main groups that we have um around the state and even um across the country as well um so yeah it definitely is an issue and um there's even been some occasions where you know there's been like translocation so movement of platypuses to other areas to try and just increase that genetic diversity for systems which aren't as interconnected so for example mary creek joins to the yarra river so obviously you've got a big connection point there your yarra river think of it as the platypus highway all right and then you've got all your side streets which are coming off that in terms of your smaller creeks where the platypus will go and, and have their burrows so you know, um, if it's a system that's more um, disconnected from these bigger pathways, you will see a reduction in genetic diversity as well. We do have a few different groupings around the country. Fantastic. Uh, a couple more questions. Uh, and I can certainly say yes to this one. Um, Martins has asked, are there food sources an issue? Are they threatened because they're having trouble accessing food? And you know, that's obviously definitely an issue. And uh, one of the reasons we don't get many in the Mary Creek, because it's more about their food source first, as Mel was saying, yeah, they a lot of the time swim up the Yarra River, the, the highway, and then get to the Mary Creek and realise, oh, there's not enough food source for me. And um, Hussain's son asks, what are the insects shown in the picture? They are called aquatic macroinvertebrates or water bugs. So um, I go out a lot, and I'm sure Mel does too, sampling for these guys because they tell us a lot about the health of our rivers and creeks. So they're a great bioindicator, but they are an amazing, an essential source of food for not just platypus, but birds, frogs, and other fish, other animals. So they are crucial. So if you don't have the water bugs, you're not going to get your, your higher level um, species. Yeah. Um, oh, here we go. There's a couple more questions. Oh, it's 200 metres downstream from Finns Reserve. Someone's seen, oh, five out of five spotting successes over the school holidays. Thanks, Anthony. Wow. Um, oh, so Robert's asked, if they don't have a stomach, do they have a large and small intestine? 
Yes, they have intestines. Yeah, I can't I can't really recall if they're separated to large and small, but there's definitely yeah a rest of the digestive system there, <laughs> and their their poo doesn't smell very good as well. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what does it smell like? Intru- uh, just yeah, not not very pleasant. I can't put it down to. Anything, <laughs> We did look at taking fecal samples to study and uh, they're very hard to come by, but they're also uh, very, very smelly. So I'm not sure what's going on in there in terms of digestion otherwise, but um, yeah, mashed up invertebrates don't smell very good. (laughs) Thanks, Mel. End of questions (laughs) for the moment. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, um, you know, the platypus gets all the credit, but these uh, invertebrates definitely need all the credit because they allow us to have fish and you know water birds and things like that as well in our creek so if you wanted to know specifically this is a dragonfly nymph so a baby dragonfly they have their larval stage in the water Um, a water boatman um, we've got a stonefly larvae and these guys are pretty sensitive they like only really nice water quality Um, and get them much in the merry Um, I don't think I've ever seen one no, and you have um, also water mites, and these guys are a lot smaller, but I'm sure they're still a tasty platypus snack as well. And platypus don't really tend to be very fussy in terms of what they eat, so a lot of my research is actually focused on getting a bit more information on the platypus's diet. And while it seems that they do have uh, sort of you know food sources which they might prefer or seek out more or can get more easily when they have options, um, they just feed generally quite quite widely so um, there's a small worm like water bug called a coronamid and these occur uh, pretty much anywhere they're very tolerant of all kind of water quality and the platypus will eat those up like their mcdonald's fries they love them they'll just keep eating them so um yeah it's, it's pretty cool um, to see that the platypus is is not so um, fast in terms of what it's eating as long as there's plenty of food for it In terms of looking at the platypus in the Mary Creek specifically, um, there's been a few um, sightings, uh, I guess sporadic sightings that have been um, documented. Um, And there are a few of the years that we've had some sightings and and apologies if I've missed any and and Peter and Julia, feel free to um, add any in that you've um, had as well. Um, Sometimes, you know, uh, platypus are sighted, but these sightings aren't documented. So um, that, you know, information doesn't get shared or um, put in larger databases, for example. But also the platypus is quite sneaky and it's very difficult to spot. So it might be there right under your nose and you just haven't seen it. Um, so it does make it really hard to know where platypus, um, you know, do occur and whether this platypus lives in that area or it's just sort of swimming through. Obviously, there was some um, recent eDNA sampling done at the Mary Creek, and we're still waiting on the results from that, but hopefully that'll give us some good news. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what eDNA sampling is a bit later and why it's extremely important uh, for us to learn more about the platypus. Um, and as Peter mentioned before, obviously, urban stream syndrome is a really big one, and that's why we're seeing um, you know, uh, less sightings or less occurrences of platypus uh, you know, closer to the city where it's more urban. Um, because you've got, you know, loss of riparian vegetation, so what shades and protects um, these areas. Um, You've got higher velocity of flow, so faster moving water, um, especially after rainfall events and things like that. We've got stormwater inputs. Um, You get a lot of um, toxicants in the water as well, which our water bugs don't like because, um, you know, not all of them are suited to poorer water qualities, and that's obviously our food for the platypus. And then because of that, you'll see a a smaller range of the different types of, you know, water bugs that you might see otherwise, which therefore limits the food resources for the platypus. So um, this is a little, I guess, what I would call platypus paradise. If the platypus got to choose uh, what their habitat would look like, they would pick something like this. It's probably missing a couple of features, but I'll talk about those as we go through. So platypus require plenty of water. So obviously they're a semi-aquatic species. So while they have their burrows, they're 100% reliant on the water for their food. Um, other than the tail fat stores, which that they can rely on in difficult times, obviously that you know resource is an infinite as well. So they need to take a bit of care with that. Um, they like flowing water, obviously not too fast. If it's really fast flowing, then it makes it harder for them and more effort for them to feed. Um, so a bit slower f- Uh, slower flowing, bit easier, bit less energy expensive um, as well. 
And they also like refuge pools. So if you have a look at the very back of the image here, you can see it gets quite dark in the water and you can tell that it's a little bit deeper. So what I mean by a refuge pool is that if um, it was really dry and hot and we hadn't had much rainfall and this um, picture really dried out, you would probably still see a pocket of water in the back sort of corner there. And this is really important because this would still allow the platypus to access some water and some, um, some food. And in addition to sort of, um, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the changes to platypus populations, looking at what we've predicted with some modelling through to 2070 based on some climate change scenarios, it's actually predicted that we'll have a around a 30% uh, reduction in suitable habitat for the platypus due to changes in climate, but also lack of water resources, particularly in the northern extent of the range. So looking up towards Queensland, but also inland as well. Uh, where it tends to be a little bit drier. So these, um, the access to water is critical for the platypus. Um, as we talked about earlier, obviously connectivity between habits is extremely important uh, for that genetic diversity so that the platypus can um, go to new areas and find mates and things like that. Um, you want environmental flows available for dry periods. This can obviously help the platypus disperse into new areas, but also support um, their food resources in terms of providing habitat uh, for the water bugs. And you also um, don't really want um, objects like weirs or any man-made structures which are blocking the platypus's ability um, to move between habitats. Like you can see in the picture, you also want well vegetated riverbanks and this provides a few benefits, one being that um, it reduces the stream water temperatures and provides, you know, protection and shelter uh, for the platypus and just keeps the environment a bit cooler. Again, thinking about as a bit of a refuge for, for our, our wet, uh, sorry, our drying and um, heating up climate. And it also allows for stabilization of the banks and obviously the platypuses burrows, which are within in terms of the root systems and that of the plants that we have here as well. Um, in the stream, which are not pictured, um, you'd have large woody debris. So these are big bits of logs and sticks um, that obviously provide areas for the platypus to forage, so to look for food, but also for platypus food, the invertebrates to live as well in terms of habitat. Um, and you don't really want to see big um, lots of sediment build up. So we call this sedimentation. Obviously, talking about how the platypus uh, forages earlier, if it's all really sandy and full of fine sediments, that'll really um, impact the way that the platypus feeds. Whereas um, these sort of cobbly um, substrate, you know, uh, that you'd see in this image here, um, or sort of larger particles um, on the on the floor of the river or creek, uh, really um, allow the platypus to feed more easily. So they tend to prefer these kind of um, habitats, or at least habitats which have sections um, with sediment that looks like this. Um, and obviously, you want minimal stormwater runoff. So. This will mean that we keep heavy metals and, um, you know, motor oil, things like that, contaminants that wash from the roads, um, you know, into the waterways, again, to keep the quality of the water high so that the platypus is food, the invertebrates and the platypus uh, are happy there. And obviously, um, you know, Peter mentioned earlier in terms of water tanks, uh, rain gardens are also another fantastic example of something that you can do at home to basically collect all this runoff, you know, that might come off your roof, for example, um, and, you know, avoid using impervious surfaces, um, you know, near water bodies as well. So by impervious surfaces, I mean anything that the water can't run through and then uh, go into the ground. So, uh, for example, your roads and most of your footpath kind of materials uh, fit that, that description. That's great, Mel. Actually, uh, Rebecca asked a question about how does a rain, having a rain tank actually help platypus in the waterways? And I think you've just answered that really well. So it's about reducing the amount of stormwater and the amounts of impurities in the stormwaters that ends up in our urban stream. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah, great question. All right. And these are some just burrows I wanted to show you. Um, these are, are burrows I took uh, images of um, during my PhD fieldwork. So 
Um, a lot of these uh, pictures were around the Alinda kind of area from memory. Um, and so these are, are a feature of your local waterway that you could keep an eye on if you're keen to track down a platypus but haven't yet been able to see one. So um, usually they'll be a little up from the water level, the average sort of water level. Obviously, as I mentioned before, you don't want your burrow quite low in terms of the water being inundated in the burrow, especially if you've got young around. Um, and they do like to hide them a bit. So you can see that they're sort of up under roots and, and within vegetation. And you can also uh, see if it's an active burrow. So if it's actively being used. So platypus can travel um, between multiple burrows um, that they might use, but particularly when they have young, they'll, they'll stick to that one burrow. So it might be a little difficult to see, but in this first picture, you can see that all the sediment here, the dirt is a little bit darker and that just shows that it's wet, okay? So you can see this little track that's been used up into the burrow um, that the platypus has been actively using uh, because it is wet. And you might even see some scratch marks uh, from their claws climbing up as well if it's a bit of a, a sort of steeper bank. And it's it a bit of a really tight squeeze, isn't it, Mel, that, that yeah. bottom one? They, they don't need much room. No, this is quite a healthy looking platypus as well, I must say. He's uh, very robust. <laughs> And if you are lucky, you might even see a platypus uh, come out and probably dawn or dusk is your, your best bet for that one as well. So good luck on your, on your burrow hunting. Someone's just asked actually where do, uh, in relation to this, where do platypus go in a flood? Like if their burrows are, I guess, flooded. Um, yeah, I guess uh, they may even have burrows of, of different heights. So they yeah, they move to high ground. To different one, but um, we do see in extreme flooding events, I'm sure that a lot of platypus would actually get displaced uh, from the area that they would usually um, live in. Um, not all burrows are necessarily uh, as close to the water levels as the ones I've shown you there. I've seen a fantastic clip. Um, I can't remember who it was from, but a platypus who's got all the burrow material tucked in its tail and it's walking up the steepest slope and falling down and crawling back up and falling down and crawling back up and um, eventually gets there. But it was so steep. So that sort of blew my mind a little bit. So um, I guess in areas where they do know that the water levels change a lot, I, I guess they have a sense for that. I'm not sure we really They've know. got an investment property just further up the bank. Yeah. Exactly right. You know, a high rise apartment that they go to um, when they need it. So, yeah, no doubt in flood events we'll have displacement of platypus, um, but hopefully they'll have a few borough options that they could rely on during that time as well. Oh, someone's just asked, can you show a platypus claw print? Don't know if we can oh, show that right now. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures um, of that on me. I did want to try and find one so I could show you, but. Um, yeah, I don't have any, but I was... I wonder if that there's that cat scratch and other tra tra that cat scratch and other traces um, by Helen somebody. I'll look it up while you're um, chatting, Mel. That they do have a lot of prints of different animals, so you can. So it's got their poos, you know, the scats and their tracks. Oh, scats, excellent. tracks, and other traces. That's it. Um, so that might actually have one in there. So I'll put the reference to that uh, in the chat for people that might be interested in seeing what a platypus claw print looks like. So you might be able to see one. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So in terms of the monitoring that Melbourne Water are doing for the platypus around um, the state, um, there's usually some live trapping that happens um, twice a year, so usually in spring and autumn, and um, around uh, 15 regular locations across uh, Melbourne based on um, where there's funding for work. And as you can see here, we use specially modified fike nets. So these fike nets have a large, large hoop entrance. And past that, you'll see further hoops uh, with netting in between. So basically, as they pass through one hoop, that netting in between will mean that they can only progress through the net and not back out again. And then obviously, you just have to take care that that back half of the net is up out of the water. So if um, the platypus enters a net between um, checks at different sites, they have somewhere that they can sit um, that's out of the water. Because obviously, um, the platypus can't breathe underwater. And then these nets also have wings, which probably a little hard to see in the diagram, but there's a longest net out to the side here and on the other side here and that will go through to each bank so basically those um, sections of net which are weighted down the bottom just with some rocks um, or some sticks um, will guide them into the net 
uh, for sampling and you'll have one net facing upstream and the other downstream. So this essentially means that platypus traveling in each direction are likely to be, be captured for, for sampling. Um, although we have had um, a platypus swimming between the two nets, so a bit cheeky, not sure how it got there, but we also have had um, other platypus that have got up and walked around on the bank and then got back into the water as well. So they're very clever and they will avoid nets. So that does make it tricky to catch them multiple times as well, which is um, something interesting that makes uh, platypus trapping even more challenging and, and getting to know more about their populations. Um, and then there's obviously other special investigations that happen. So for example, in uh, K Cardinia Creek, uh, they put some trackers on a, a few platypus and we're tracking them uh, for a period of time as well. Um, here's a little bit of um, data on the live trapping. So um, this is a summary of catch um, per unit effort. That's what CPUE stands for, so catch per unit effort. And uh, these are some of the regular study sites. Um, so just looking at the, the name of the site above the graph below it. And essentially what it's showing is um, data points over time. Um, and how many platypus you're sort of catching for the amount of, of effort that you're putting in in terms of number of nights that you would go out and trap the platypus. So um, on the left-hand side of each little graph is uh, 1995 through to uh, 2020 on the far right side of each graph. So generally the trend you can see from some of the lines that you've got on the graph there is from the increased effort, you're generally um, catching fewer platypus but in some uh, locations, you're um, seeing the same amount of platypus. So uh, what you could infer is that those uh, sites where you're um, getting about the same amount of platypus for your effort um, is that the numbers uh, are pretty consistent there in terms of the population sizes. In terms of looking at, I guess this is more sort of the general uh, Melbourne area or greater Melbourne area, not so much um, all of Victoria, but um, these uh, dots on um, the, the map of Melbourne show you um, where we've um, trapped platypus or at least got some, some eDNA samples of platypus. So the darker green shows you where platypus are present. Uh, the light green shows you where trace amounts of eDNA have been found. So it's, it's likely that platypus uh, are present here or say travel through the area, for example. Um, gray is showing no platypus detected through um, samples um, done through eDNA or live capture. And then the orange uh, indicates captures through trapping um, using the flag nets that I just showed earlier. So if we have a look at here at Murray Creek, this doesn't include the sampling done at the start of the year. So we're waiting and seeing, um, but unfortunately nothing there as of yet, although we have had sightings. So we do know that they are around, but maybe they use this area seasonally, or maybe they come and go, um, or maybe some individuals are moving into the area. So it's definitely an area for further investigation. That's great. I've got about three to four minutes to Mel. Oh, sure. Gonna have so to you know. You. Yeah, right. <laughs> thought I'd let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I told you I could talk forever on the platypus. <laughs> In terms of um, what you can do to help us uh, get more information about the platypus is to uh, log your observations. So anytime that you do see a platypus, don't worry if you're not able to get a picture, but if you can't, can, that's even better. Um, to upload these to the website platypusspot.org. This is a really great resource where you can go onto the website and actually see where people have logged sightings. So if you're looking to try and go uh, spot a platypus, um, this is a great place to find some options uh, because you'll be able to see where they've been found or where they've been seen recently. In terms of um, eDNA, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is stands for environmental DNA. And this is a relatively new technique that captures um, eDNA in a water sample. So from a water sample, it's possible for us to identify multiple species. And this is obviously really good for tracking invasive, rare and elusive species. So for the platypus that avoid our nets, they can't avoid getting captured by this water sample. So basically we'll have our organisms in the environment, and from there, they'll shed their DNA as they're moving around, going about their everyday business. We can take a water sample and put it through a filter, and this will extract all the uh, DNA in the water sample. We'll then take that back to the lab and compare what's in that 
um, filter to known samples um, from each of the different species we're trying to identify. So we could particularly just be looking at platypus or trying to pick up all the different species we found in that waterway. So um, this has been happening in Mombok and Werribee Creeks for quite some time now. Um, and we're looking forward to obviously rolling this out to more sites. So this is a little figure which shows um, three main areas. So on the um, left, you have your Werribee River. Uh, in the middle, you have Jackson's Creek, which will pop up shortly. That hasn't been sampled as many times. And on the right, you've got Mombog Creek. So it just sort of shows you how in green, um, there's positive results, so platypus present, and in red, a negative result, so platypus not present. So you can see that that does change over that span of time in this map here from 2015 to 2019 as well. And any yellow dots just refer to, um, you know, we're not actually sure. Um, it wasn't a strong enough DNA sample to say if it was definitely platypus present or not. Sorry, it doesn't want to switch. There we go. All right. The advantages of eDNA is that it's um, really quite easy to take a sample. So rather than, you know, staying up all night to trap platypus or hope to trap a platypus in the net, um, you can go out any time and take a sample. It's fairly cheap um, compared to most uh, analysis methods. We have high confidence in the data because we get multiple samples at each site so we can compare those. It's not invasive. You don't have to catch the platypus and obviously many people can be involved as well. The disadvantages are that contamination is possible. Um, you can't determine how many platypus are at a site from the DNA. So a really strong um, you know, DNA signal might tell you that there are quite a lot of platypus there, but you won't know how many. Um, and obviously without trapping individuals, you don't get to know how old they were or if you've trapped an individual multiple times um, from getting an eDNA sample but it is a really great way for us to get a lot of information on the platypus really easily. So something that you can be involved in now is the Great Australian Platypus Search and I uh, encourage you to go to this website and I'm sure Julia will send out the information. For yeah, you well. I'll send you more and I, if you're in Melbourne, don't bother because all the sites aren't there. So I'll, I'll talk about that briefly afterwards. So um, with this platypus search, this is a citizen science project. So you can choose uh, a site you can sign up and you'll get sent out an eDNA kit. Um, you can join the Facebook group whether you're able to participate or not. I highly encourage you if you're interested just to join the group to see um, what's happening and, and what we're going to find. Um, and you can also download the app, which you'll need if you're um, going out sampling. And these are all of the sites across Victoria that um, we're going to be sampling. So there's over 2,000 sites. Um, which is probably, I think, one of the biggest citizen science projects that's occurred. And there are still some sites left. So if you're in Victoria and live close to these areas um, or are hopeful that we'll be able to travel a bit further soon, um, like myself, then please sign up for these sites. They obviously understand that it's been a bit difficult during lockdown, but are keen for anyone who's keen to participate to be able to. Um, so please have a look at that. And I know Julia will talk a bit more about that in the moment in a moment in terms of the Mary Creek as well. So just head to the website if you'd like more information. In terms of threats to the platypus, there are uh, quite a few, unfortunately. Um, obviously, the impact of the recent bushfires has been a huge one for our aquatic environments as well. Um, dogs and foxes in terms of predation. Um, so um, just making sure that we're keeping our dogs on leads because even if they're playing in the waterway where platypus might occur, um, the platypus could feel uncomfortable, threatened, and wouldn't want to be in that environment. So it's really important that we're keeping our dogs on lead in areas where there might be platypus. Um, disconnected waterways, which I talked about a bit uh, earlier, um, the absence of riparian vegetation, so lacking sort of coverage um, and also uh, thermal refugia for the platypus, as well as water flows. So obviously you've got your extremes of flood, which could affect and displace the platypus and flow into the burrows, as well as the other side of things, which is drought. So not enough water resource for the platypus to get food. And then you've obviously got the inputs of storm water as well. So there's sort of three different angles of water flow that affect the platypus there. In terms of storm uh, 30 water. 30 seconds left, Mel. Sorry, <laughs> but I'm the timekeeper. That's all right. You'd all be aware that obviously litter and contaminants come through the system. So 
in terms of what you can do, just making sure that, um, you know, any of these litter items which we see around the platypus in terms of entanglement or any discarded fishing line and opera house nets, uh, which are now banned, which is fantastic. If you see them in the waterway, please remove them, okay, and call fisheries to report that the net's been there um, and they can potentially follow up who's putting them out. But it's really important that you just keep focusing on doing uh, little things that make a big difference. So planting trees, throwing rubbish in the bin, snipping any circular litter before you dispose it, keeping dogs on leash around the waterway, as I said before, reporting any sightings in platypus spot, um, not using opera house nets and taking and disposing of fishing line responsibility, responsibly. And also today, I just guess I'd like to finish off with, usually we'd ask everyone to make a pledge for the platypus. And it's really great that the um, Merry Creek Management Committee are committing to bringing platypus back to the creek. I think that's a huge pledge for the platypus. Thank you so much, Mel. That was fantastic. I know you could go on for another hour and we would all be spellbound. It would be <laughs> fascinating, but we've only got an hour. So we'll have to stop this time. But uh, please do put in the feedback if you really enjoyed tonight. And we can certainly have Mel come back another time and talk about the things we didn't get time to. So thank you so much, Mel. Um, yes, we've, so. Only got, yeah, we've only got a few minutes. So those that want to stay behind a little bit after, I'll talk about the eDNA project on the Merry Creek. But there were some questions for Peter to answer. And I saw there was someone that asked a couple of times about a particular question Peter so do you mind if I pose that to you about dogs on leads and I think that's because I know that Darabin Council's having a dogs on lead off lead area I think in the Edwards Park Lake so perhaps that's where that stemmed from so I think someone's just asked about the off issue of off lead dogs um, is that sort of I guess within our remit or something we should be focusing on um, it, we'll be focusing on everything that's needed to return the platypus to a viable population in, in the Merry Creek and conflicts over usage are, um, you know, one of the things that we've got to collectively tackle and part of it will be about community education, as, as Mel says, about keeping uh, dogs on leads and so on. And, you know, we, we will probably also be looking at, you know, working with council and Melbourne Water to, you know, fence off areas so that... Uh, uh, so that uh, dogs can be kept out of uh, your critical habitat. But there's there's so much to do. Peter Barrett asked the question there about what the plan is. The, the, the plan is to um, get a holistic science-based um, study done by Josh Griffith to tell us, uh, you know, what kind of remediation works we need to undertake. And, you know, as I said earlier, one of the things, first things we've got to do is to win the current planning uh, debates that are going on in the headwaters to retain uh, as much of the um, uh, remaining wetland as we can and then through things like smart water tanks and other uh, initiatives to um, normalise water flows from urban stream syndrome then we've got a, we've got a chance but it will be a holistic uh, plan that we need um, plastic pollution the whole you know so dogs is a, they're, it's a multifaceted problem and it will take a long time but and it's obviously lots of players and that's what the paddle's about isn't it it's collaborating yeah. with all the stakeholders to get those we're not suggesting that we the paddle can do all of this it's about having some extra support for these uh, for the stakeholders that we already work with who are already doing fabulous things but uh, right. it's focusing on certain areas for with the platypus in mind yeah and we, we, we should pay tribute to the fact that the reason why we've got even a, a long-term chance of, of getting the platypus back is because you know community has fought for 30 years to prevent the merry creek being converted into a drone under a freeway so you know this is work that stands on the shoulders of giants who have gone before us to keep the creek um, in community hands which we all get to enjoy now in lockdown you mean so many people already knew this and lots of you here have worked for many years on improving the creek but equally there's so many other people that haven't really you know thought about oh yeah there's the merry creek down the road from me oh, i'll go there in lockdown because i've only got 5ks and they've really started to appreciate it i get all day long in my job how many people are saying oh i didn't even think it was there i didn't realize how beautiful and amazing it was so uh, i went down there for a walk just uh, around coburg and south with someone who's lived in the area for 30 years and hadn't been down there for 30 years and was just amazed at how much has changed yeah. so uh, you know there's so many people here that we can would think about that and uh, that's right we're not doing anything new the paddle we're basically building on things that have happened already and hopefully trying to focus on a few things to get them happening
Mm. So that's fantastic. Um, look, the chat's been blowing up. Um, I think I've captured most things, but there's a few there. So feel free to answer some people's questions if you have them. I'm sort of running out of time and I can't get to all of it, but I can see that there's a lot of interest uh, here and lots of people have some really great background and want to share what they've been learning and where to go from here. So do feel free to get in touch with Peter and the, um, uh, the Mary Paddle uh, for if you'd like further information. Please fill out, fill out the feedback form. That's probably the best place to start. And tell us what you think the Paddle should focus on. Tell us if you want to be a part of it <laughs> and help us do it. Um, the last thing I was going to mention before uh, I let you all go, and I was going to say thank you all for coming. If you have to go, um, that's fine, But and thank you for coming. Uh, the last thing I was just going to mention was the eDNA project. It's called the Great Platypus Search, and I'll actually put the um, the actual link in the chat. But it's basically collecting, as Mel was talking about, collecting eDNA on the Merry Creek. It's actually all around um, Victoria, but I'm focusing uh, on the Merry Creek. So Water Watch um, has been asked to be involved. So we're not running the program; we're just a part of it, one of the partners. So there's about I've got about eight sites. Uh, most of them are on the Merry Creek and I've got a couple near the Yarra River where the Merry Creek comes in and, or on a couple of sites on the Mooney Ponds Creek. So if that's something that interests you, you could certainly um, email me directly. The problem is that we can't meet out on site. I can meet with one other person. I think at the moment we've got two households, so two of us could meet out there, but we can't really have a group of us, sadly. So I'm just sort of logistically trying to work out how we can do that. And one way is I'll probably end up filming myself at a couple of spots uh, and showing people that way. So that's a bit unfortunate. We can't really do it that way, but I am going to get the packs, the, you know, the syringes to actually get the sample. And there might be some opportunities for people to come and join me one household <laughs> and maybe two if it's got to be done by the end of October. So that's unfortunate. We have, we've only got a limited time frame because the scientists actually want the data collected when platypus are breeding and when the water level's high enough. So there's no point doing it in summer or in winter. It's got to be in the when when things are optimum for the platypus. So we, we unfortunately can't push that you know, to next year when perhaps restrictions are less. Um, so we sort of have to do it now. So if you're interested in that, um, I'll definitely put my, I'll put my email address in the chat so you can um, email me directly. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's about it, everybody, because uh, I know, notice we've gone over time a little bit. Unless, Peter, there was anything else you wanted to mention before I wave goodbye? No. So I'll put some things in the chat. And I just want to thank uh, Mel for her wonderful talk, Dr. Mel, tonight. I think you're going to agree she's very passionate about the platypus. And um, you can come back anytime, Mel. Um, I've already had people saying they're looking forward to webinar number two. <laughs> Oh, thank you. More than happy to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold you to that. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank also uh, the, the Mary Platypus Paddle for making this event possible, uh, as well as the funders, the cities of Darabin, Yarra, Moreland and Whittlesea, who have all been very supportive with everything the Mary Paddle are doing uh, and everything we do at MCMC as well. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Really appreciate it.